I'm now going to continue my video series on Henry Ward Beecher and his sermons by discussing the Sabbath day. In the first part of this video, I will be addressing Mr. Repsion. Later in this video, I will be addressing the Instagram user known as Country Sweetie. So let's start with Mr. Repsion. Mr. Repsion, are you aware that the Sabbath day is on a Saturday instead of a Sunday? After all, you proclaim an in-depth knowledge of Christianity. If that's the case, you already know that God himself established the seven-day week. Granted, God did not name those, those particular days, okay? He didn't come up with a name of every single day, but he did establish the seven-day week, and he also was the one who established the Sabbath, okay? So if all that's the case, why do churches conduct their services on a Sunday instead of a Saturday? Well, the primary reason is that Jesus himself was crucified at the beginning of a Sabbath. And according to the Bible, he rose from the dead at the end of a Sabbath. Okay? And what was the end of a Sabbath day? It was Sunday. According to the Jewish calendar, the first day of the week is Sunday and not Monday. We Westerners have Monday as the beginning of our week. But back there in Galilee, in Judea, if you're following the Jewish calendar, the first day of the week is actually Sunday, not Monday. Their Sunday, our Monday. Okay? But that's not the only reason. Oh, no. Another reason is that you couldn't do work on the Sabbath day. Okay, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes made sure of that. And if they ever caught you doing work, it was a very costly penalty. I'm not kidding you. Working on the Sabbath, that was a big no-no. And that meant you couldn't teach on a Sabbath day either. Think about that for a second. So, it was bad enough that the people ordained by Christ, okay, remember all those apostles that followed Jesus for those three years, Jesus himself ordained those apostles to teach his good word. Okay, So all of these apostles, they were still in Judea, they were still in Galilee when they started their teaching. Okay, So if they were teaching on a Sabbath day, but remember it was bad enough they were teaching about Jesus, now they were offending people by teaching on a Sabbath day? They didn't want to compound the problem they already had. Okay. Now, who were some of the first people that the apostles of Jesus were teaching at that time? Well, they were Jewish. Some of the first people that were taught about Jesus and Christianity were Jewish. What were Galileans? They were Jewish. Where would they be normally on a Saturday? Well, they'd be in a synagogue. So how are we supposed to teach them about Christianity if they're in a synagogue listening to their Jewish preacher? So that's a third problem. And a third good reason why they started teaching on Sundays rather than on Saturdays. See what I mean? So that's three good reasons why Christianity is celebrated on a Sunday instead of on a Saturday. And that concludes my statement to Mr. Repsion. Now then, there are two ways that a church is financially supported. One way is the way Paul did it. Okay, we're talking about St. Paul now, and we're now going to address Country Sweetie. Okay, so Country Sweetie, if you're paying attention, now I'm going to talk to you. One way that St. Paul supported himself and his ministry was he was tent making. This can be found in the book of Acts chapter 18. Okay. Now what those tents actually were were prayer shawls. Now here's an interesting thing to think about. All right. If St. Paul was not offended in making prayer shawls, as a matter of fact that's what he did, he actually had one all the days of his life. Even though he was now Christian, he still had his prayer shawl. Why don't more Christians have prayer shawls? I don't know. We should. See what I mean? Remember, Christianity is nothing more than Judaism plus Jesus Christ. 
the New Testament Christians had no intentions of separating the Jews from the Christians. That's an absolute myth. It's a lie. It's just not true. Okay? The only thing that we want, we as Christians wanted the Jews to believe in was that Christ was the Messiah. That's it. We believe in their Old Testament laws. That's right. That's why we have a Bible with an Old and New Testament. We still read their Torah. We recognize King David. Okay? See what I mean? So just because we added Jesus Christ to the equation doesn't necessarily mean we threw away Judaism. Not in the least. I would have no problem displaying a menorah. I would have no problem displaying a Star of David. Not at all. And I do support Jewish people. Especially now in their darkest hour. So, I don't know why there are churches out there, and not a lot of them, but there are some churches that try to separate Judaism out of Christianity. Why are you doing that? Jesus wouldn't do that. The apostles didn't do that. Why are you? Okay, so let's go on here. Now, we already know that St. Paul had a weekly salary, and then he would teach on the weekends. Okay, that was, that's one way to do it. Now, modern-day ministers will actually have an offering plate. What they do is they teach their congregation, all right, and their congregation support their minister and whatever ministry he's running by putting money in the offering plate. Perhaps this minister runs a soup kitchen, or perhaps he um, helps the elderly, or perhaps he actually sends money to missionaries that go overseas and teach the good word in more dangerous places, uh, say in the Middle East, or there are actually places in Europe and even in Asia where it's a little more dangerous to teach Christianity than it is here in the United States. Okay? So he supports missionaries that go overseas. And so this congregation then supports him. Now here's the kick. If this congregation is horribly poor because they have either underpaying jobs or they don't have jobs at all, how are they going to support him? They're starving down here. They're not going to be able to support him. This is something that was going on in first century Judea. Let me tell you something, those Galileans were so poor they could barely feed themselves and then they were supposed to pay some kind of a temple tax? Get real. So, you say, well, then the problem is that we have to start getting these people out of either underpaying jobs or out of unemployment. Because if we don't, they're going to be facing eviction, starvation, some won't last very long. Get the picture? So, it's up to people like me to help them out. Now, here's the thing. Okay? A lot of churches nowadays are helping people like this, the underpaid or the unemployed, they're helping people fill out resumes. That's true. That's, that's very true. And that's very nice. But that's all they're doing. A lot of times, the reason they're in the situation that they're in in the first place, okay, is because they are functionally illiterate. Now, not necessarily illiterate in the line of reading. That's bad enough, okay? So, there are some people that simply cannot read a book. Now, here's the thing. How are they supposed to read the Bible if they can't read a book? There are some churches that are starting literacy programs to eliminate that. Because if they don't read, if these people don't read their Bible, how are they going to get ministered by their minister? They're not going to understand a word he says. That's the way it works. If they can't read, they can't understand him. What if he tells them to read a Bible scripture in his presentation? How are they going to read that? They can't read, so how are they going to read it? It doesn't take prayer with God to solve that answer. 
All it takes is for you to form some kind of literacy program to educate them. That's the difference. Let me tell you something. These underemployed and unemployed people, a lot of their problem doesn't have to be prayed over. They just need a better education. Okay? So, if we're going to solve the unemployed and underemployed problem with these people, we have to have part our job and part God's job. What is our job? God gave us a brain. Okay? What really surprises me is that I've actually been in churches where over 50% of the congregation couldn't count change. How are they supposed to count change to put it in your offering plate if they can't count money? Ever think about that? If they can't count money, how are they going to put it in the offering plate? They will have no idea what they're giving to you. They may be able to read and write, but they can't count. And that's just as bad. And if they can't count change to put in your offering plate, what makes you think they're ever going to hold a retail job or any other job? They're not. And that's why they're unemployed. But they can also be computer illiterate. Remember, many organizations today, many, many uh, employers today, okay, in those jobs, you have to know how to run the internet. You have to run how to, how to you have to know how to run a computer. Cash registers are all computerized now. How do you expect these people who can't count change to ever run a computer? You can't. You have to teach them. And that doesn't require prayer at all. You say, "Well, the minister doesn't have time to teach them all that stuff." Okay, granted, but I do right here on this YouTube. Okay, and there are many Christians out there with smartphones, with computers. They know how to run the computers. They know how to run the smartphones. Why aren't they teaching these people who are functionally computer illiterate how to run those things and how to learn from me. I don't know. Let me tell you something. If you want these people to get into higher paying gainful employment, they're going to have to know a little more than how to read a book and how to count change. That's the way it works. We are shifting in our society from an industrialized society to an intellectual society. You're either smart or you don't get a job. That's the way it works. Don't believe me? Just take a look at your jobs nowadays. You have to be smart or they won't take you. If you don't have a high school diploma or a GED, you don't get a job. Period. It doesn't happen anymore. The old days you did. Now you don't. Even farming is computerized. Don't believe me? Go take a look at the tractors they've got nowadays. They're all computerized now. Just about every piece of farm equipment is computerized. You'd be hard pressed to find any job these days here in the United States that isn't computerized in some form or another. Even the time clocks are computerized. How are you supposed to pit, punch in and out of your shift? Don't use it. You don't use a physical card anymore. You punch it in. I know because I work at a retail job and I have to punch myself in and I have to punch myself out on a computer. So that means I know how, I have to know how to operate a computer and I have to know how to punch myself in and punch myself out. There you go. So like I said, you don't, there is no reason for prayer when it comes to educating these people. All you have to do is find people in your congregation that are smart enough to educate the rest of them. Let me clear something up for you right now. Matthew was smart. Okay, He was a tax collector, so he knew how to read and write. He also knew how to do arithmetic. He was a very analytical thinker. And if we wanted to get into technicalities here, Judas himself was smart because he was the treasurer of the group for three years. 
It's sad to see what happened to him, but on the other hand, he was a pretty smart guy, and he did know how to read and write. Peter, I guarantee you, Peter was smart. He knew how to read. He knew how to write. He knew how to do arithmetic. How else could he sell his fish? And we all know that St. Paul, he used to be Saul of Tarsus, a Pharisee. You didn't become a Pharisee by being ignorant. Oh no. He was smart. Okay? And God didn't just suddenly make him smart one day. He actually learned from private tutors. That's the way it worked. And Luke, even though he wasn't one of the original 12 that followed Jesus, okay, granted, he himself was a doctor. That means he, he knew how to read, he knew how to write, he knew how to do arithmetic. This was a smart man. Why is it that half of our congregations, not all of them, but there are, there are congregations in the United States, in churches right now, and over half of them are functionally illiterate? That's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. If Matthew was smart, Mark was smart, John was smart, Peter was smart, Luke was smart, and Paul was smart, why aren't they? If you start seeing that in your church, that needs to be fixed. And it doesn't need to be prayed over, it needs to be fixed. And there is a way to do that. Okay? I know there are people in your congregation that run smartphones all the time. That have computer skills. And they can share that information with these kind of people. And once that information is shared, they can then send it to my YouTube channel where I am providing free education 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, so these people can get smart. So that's our part. That's right, we have our part, now we have to have God's part. What is God's part? Well, first of all, keep in mind that when we're talking about education, it has to be God-centered. Okay? We do want to establish a God moral base into their education. No question about that. I have no problem with that whatsoever. Matter of fact, I encourage it. Yes, your education should be God-centered. But let me tell you something. This Bible here will never teach you how to pour concrete, how to fix an engine in a car, how to fix deluxe food. It will never teach you how to operate a microwave successfully. This book doesn't teach you stuff like that. It won't teach you what varnish to use on a chair or on an end table. This book doesn't teach you stuff like that. So, if you're using this book as a moral compass, you're using the right book. But, this should not be your only education. It should be the center of your education, but it should not be the only education you ever have. And that's the difference. So, you say, well, how do we get these people to read, write, do arithmetic, that kind of stuff? A lot of that information is right here on my YouTube channel. Not everything, but a lot of it is. You, you congregations can teach people how to read and write. And some churches do, and I applaud them for that. As a matter of fact, for every single church that has a literacy program, I applaud you. For every single church that has a mathematics program, I applaud you. It's needed. Adult ed is very much needed in this day and age. I applaud you if that's what you're doing. Okay? I want you to know that if you're doing stuff like that, I support you 100%. And for additional education, you should come here because it would take a long time to teach these people trigonometry and calculus and, and how to learn a foreign language, that kind of stuff. And I know some of you people just don't have the time to devote to stuff like that. Some of you people work two to three jobs. That's what I'm here for. I have that kind of time and that's why I'm teaching this to all of you. So, 
If you want to have these people learn how to be a little more computer literate, if you want these people to learn how to operate a foreign language, or learn ma advanced mathematical skills or accounting, bring them here. If you don't have the time to teach that kind of stuff, send them here. I will do it for you. I have no problem with that whatsoever. And if that's what you're doing in your church, I applaud you again. I want to let you know I support you if you send people to me to educate. Because I want to help them out. I want to get them out of eviction and starvation. I don't want them there anymore. And certainly, I don't want kids being bullied in school anymore. And I know that if their GPA suddenly rises, they're placed in advanced placement courses where the bullies don't follow them, and then they're safe from that moment forward. And they stop getting bullied all the time. And that's exactly what I want. See what I mean? So, what I'm saying here, and I'll make this super simple, is when it comes to eviction, starvation, and bullyism, there is a part we have to do because we have a brain and we can get educated, and then there's a part that God has to do. Now what's God's part? When we get properly educated, then we go to God and we say, where do you want me to work? I have the skills now, I can do what you need me to do, so where do you want me to go? And then God shows you exactly where he wants you to go. See what I mean? Once you have the necessary occupational skills, God can then show you the kind of job he wants you to work at. Your part? God's part. You don't need prayer to get job skills. And you also don't need to spend a mass dose of money that you don't really have to get job skills. You can come right here and learn it all for free. And take what I'm offering you and apply it to your education. Okay? You don't have to sit there and say, Oh, Lord, Lord, give me more money so I can stand there and get a better education. Because God's now sending you the answer, Hey, Ted's here. I've sent him directly to you, so you don't have to pay that tons of tuition. You can advance yourself quite a bit before you have to go into college. And the more I teach, the less you'll have to spend time in college. The way it works. So like I say, there's our part, then there's God's part. That's the difference. All right. Now then, what is the Sabbath day supposed to be used for? Well, let's get into the rest of this lesson. It's supposed to be used for Christian fellowship. Ever heard the song, Onward Christian Soldier? Well, if you're never in church, you don't know who your allies are. Think about this. If we go back to a story with Elijah, Elijah was sitting there telling God, Hey, I don't, need, I don't have any, a single ally. He told God he didn't have a single ally. You know what God said? Well, guess what? You're delusional because guess what? You have more allies than you think. And when Elijah realized that, his situation dramatically improved. Like I said, if you don't go to church, you don't know who your allies are. And you're going to need them at some point. Because not everything can be solved in a textbook. Let me tell you something. When push comes to shove, this little textbook is not going to solve all your problems. It might get you a better paying job, but there are some problems only God himself can solve. And that's the truth. So, now you say, well, my employer does everything he can to prevent me from going to church and having my Sabbath day. Okay. Well, if you work at a retail job, that's probably true. You say, well, how do I eliminate that problem? Well, that comes from 
getting a higher paying occupation or having an occupation where you are your own boss. See what I mean? Say, well, how am I supposed to do that? I'm functionally illiterate. Now, that's where my YouTube channel comes in. I educate you, you take that education, you make either your own business or you apply to a higher paying occupation and you get that job. Just make sure to ask God which way he wants you to go. Okay? Because I can get you the education you need, but once that's done, I can't tell you what job you need to go into. Only God can tell you that. Remember, there's your part and God's part. My part is to teach you what you'll need to get a higher paying occupation. God's part is to tell you where he wants you to go. That's when you start praying. When you've got the skills, you then ask God where he wants you to go and he tells you where he wants you to go. Okay. So, you say, well, I can't just suddenly quit my job. I don't expect you to quit your job. I expect you to learn all this stuff and then properly resign from your job once you have acquired a higher paying occupation. Then the, then the employer begins to realize that it would be silly for you to stay at a lower paying job when you have the qualifications to get a higher paying job. And so you give the employer that you have now a 14 day notice and say, look, I have an opportunity to advance my career and that's what I'm going to do. Employers understand things like that. You give them 14 days to find a decent replacement for you. And then you just simply quietly walk away with a resignation letter. That's a little different than just saying, hey, I don't like the fact that you're not giving me Sundays off. I just quit. Or being mad at the boss because he doesn't give you Sundays off. There are more tactful ways to handle that situation than just storming out of your job. Because all you're doing when you're storming out of your job is you're cutting off any potential income that you could get. And that's not what we want you to do. Okay? Now, the Sabbath day is not a day to gain personal wealth. This is a far cry that, than from somebody who works in a retail job on a Sunday just so that he can have a meal at night and keep a roof over his head. There's a big difference between being self-sustaining and being greedy. Okay? We don't want you to be greedy on a Sabbath day. But we want you to be self-sustaining. So, if you're in a retail job right now, and you have to work on Sundays just to put food on the table, that's okay. But if you have a multi-million dollar mansion, and a yacht, and a Ferrari, and all you're doing in the line of working on a Sunday is so you can maintain all your little toys, that's wrong. That's the difference. Okay? So God does not want you to con conduct your greedy business on a Sunday. That would offend God. Like I said, there's a big difference between somebody working in retail trying to support themselves and their families and somebody that's just like super million dollar rich trying to support his bad habits. Big difference. Okay? Now then, The Sabbath day must not be dreaded. There are some people that dread the Sabbath day. Why? Well, part of it is because they sing a lot of songs that they can't connect to. And that's something I'm going to fix on this YouTube channel. I am going to actually talk about some of these old-time Christian hymns, who wrote them, and why they were written. And you'll have a greater appreciation for singing these things based on the information I give to you. And that's something I will be doing in the not so distant future. So now you have a better reason to sing these songs because you'll know why they were created in the first place. Gives a meaning at long last. And if you want to start all this, I would suggest that you people look up the name John Newton because the author of Amazing Grace was John Newton. And if you read what kind of a life that man led, 
you'll have a greater appreciation for Amazing Grace, I can tell you that. And before you start singing We Three Kings again, you better get to understanding who wrote that song, which was a minister, and it was written back in the 1850s. And except for memorization purposes, that song has little relevance to Christianity. That's the truth. Check it out for yourself. You'll find out really quick. Now, another reason why people tend to dread Sundays, dread, dread going to Sabbath services, okay, is because there are little committees and, uh, well, this committee helps people with the dinners because a lot of these churches have church dinners after they finish with their with their sermons okay or they'll have a, a nursery thing or whatever if you're being overworked in the nursery or you're being overworked in the kitchen trying to cook up these dinners for the church well that's a pretty bad thing you might want to say look I don't mind helping you people out but I'm not going to become you guys a slave. That's not what the Sabbath day was all about. It's as much my day of rest as it is yours. I'm going to do just certain, certain things and that's it. And stand your ground. Say, look, I'm not going to do more than this. If I'm going to teach a Sunday school class, that's fine. I will teach a Sunday school class. But I'm not going to teach it all the time because I need to be ministered to. Say me. And some of these ministers are completely overworked. They're trying to run Sunday school, and they're trying to run uh, dinners and and uh, uh, nurseries and that kind of thing. That, that's ridiculous. Don't overwork your minister. Okay, he has enough on his plate trying to raise a family. Usually, trying to do this, trying to do that. He doesn't need any more added to his plate than already is. Okay? Listen, your minister does not have to be the greatest singer in the, in the world. He just needs somebody in his congregation that is one of the greatest singers in the world. And probably more than one because if that guy gets sick, somebody else has to take over. See what I mean? So... The Sabbath is to be used as a day to heal the bodies and souls of people. And if you come out of a service and you don't feel any different than what you went in to, to, to do, then maybe you should reevaluate where you're at. Maybe you should go someplace else. Okay? If your minister is really refreshing your body and soul, through Christianity, through messages, through songs, that kind of thing, you should show your gratitude, especially financially. Let him know he's really doing a good job. You say, well, wait a minute. I'm still earning all this money. Start learning from this YouTube channel and then start using that information to go where God wants you to go so that you can earn the kind of money to show your appreciation to your minister. See me? I hope you're comprehending all of these concepts because this, this is a lot of stuff I've covered here tonight. As you know, I was talking about this last night in a presentation that I made last night. And I was telling you guys that this was a rather lengthy presentation and so therefore. Well, now you see why it's such a, a lengthy presentation. So to conclude my message to Country Sweetie, one, the Sabbath day is a day not to be dreaded. Matter of fact, it should be such a wonderful experience that when you have to travel somewhere, let's say you have to move away, you will have such fond memories of your Sabbath days that you'll wish that you were back there. You should never dread Sabbath day. You should be uh, homesick for it, really. You should be say, saying to people, I wish I was back there. Because it was a, such a wonderful experience. I remember my minister fondly. I remember the congregation fondly. I got to know those people. That, that's, that's another key right there. Right there. 
if people are brushing you off at your church, go find another church. If they are not so overjoyed to see you because you are still alive and you're as much a child of God as they are, if they're not overjoyed to see you week after week, then maybe it's time to find some place that really does appreciate you being around. And it should not matter how much you put in that offering plate. Let me say that again. It should never matter how much you how much money you place in that offering plate as to how much they appreciate you. They should be thankful you're still alive. They sh you're still able to listen to those sermons. They you're still able to interact with them. Don't worry about the money in your in the offering plate. I'm going to help you fix that. That's my job. I'll help you take care of that. Okay? Like I said, if people are just starting to brush you off and they really don't appreciate you being there, maybe you should go find someplace else where they will appreciate you. Because a real reverend would be overjoyed to see you. And a real congregation would be overjoyed to see you. And you should be just as overjoyed to see them as they are to see you. And if they don't get to know you real well, and you don't get to know them real well, something's wrong. Something's very wrong. I know that's a lot of points I'm making. One of the things I've said so often is, stop saying, I'll pray for you, and start saying, I'll pray with you. And you say, well, what if the person you want to pray for lives hundreds of miles away? Well, you have a smartphone, and a computer, and a telephone. You can pray together with a person over the phone. You can pray together with a person even over Facebook. You can have the Facebook Messenger, and you can pray with them right over that. There goes your excuse out the window. Okay? And if you really run into a situation where you just, there's just no way to interact with this other person, then what you do is you go to your congregation and they together pray for that person. We will pray for that person. Not, uh, I will pray for that person. We will pray for that person. Because Jesus loves Christian unity. We pray for that person. This group pay, prays for that person. If, you're, if, if you and your group are praying for this person, then that person should find their own group and pray for you. So, the trick is, it's more of a pray with you than a pray for you. That's, why, that's one of the reasons why you gather together in fellowship. So you're supposed to gather in fellowship because you're supposed to worship God. What, is, what does that mean? What does that actually mean? Some people are like, well, I don't know. What that means is, when you go to that church, not only you want to fellowship with other Christians to find out who your allies are and who aren't your allies, but on top of that, you are actually making a statement saying, I want to spend time with God. But I also want to spend time with these wonderful people. And those wonderful people want, want to spend as much time with you as they do with God. See what I mean? Because if God himself sees you as an important person, and God sees every single person on the face of this earth as an important people, God even sees your worst foes as important people. Okay? I know, it's hard, hard to understand. Why would God see your worst fo fo foe as, a, as an important person? Because God loves everybody. That doesn't mean that God takes everybody to heaven. It just means that God loves everybody. And he's saddened when somebody chooses a path that takes them into self-peril. Which ultimately destroys them. That breaks God's heart because God doesn't want it that way. 
but he'll let that person choose to go down go down into the pit. Remember, the only thing that happens in line of the difference between heaven and hell is that the that the people that choose to go to hell, they chose it. They chose to experience hell. God didn't choose it for them. They chose it for themselves. They had a choice. They just made the wrong one. Wow. Whew. That's a lot of information to cover. So, my points to Country Sweetie is that you should have a God-centered education. That's true. But if you don't have good occupational skills, God himself cannot place you into a higher paying occupation. And God wants you in these higher paying occupations because he wants you to support your ministers. And how are you supposed to support your ministers when you don't have any money? It doesn't work that way. So it is as much in God's interest as it is in your interest to get yourself into a higher paying occupation. The only way you're going to do that is through a higher education. The only way you can get something like that when you don't have any money. If you have lots of money, you can just go to a major university and take care of that. But when you don't have a whole lot of money, what are you going to do? Get a bunch of loans that you can't pay back? No. You come right here and I help you. That's the difference. Church fellowship should never be dreaded, and if it's dreaded, you need to find another church. Church fellowship should never be a burden upon you. If you're given too many tasks at a church, say, look, I'm not doing all this, and stand your ground. If they don't like it, you leave that church, and you find another church that won't give you quite so much. That'll give you what you can handle. And most importantly, if Mr. Repsion thinks he's offending us with this Face Palm Sunday, he's not. Because, after all, think about this for a second. We only celebrate on Sunday because of three reasons. One, because it's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Two, is because we didn't want to interfere with the teachings of the Jewish people on a Saturday. And three, we didn't want to be accused of breaking Sabbath day law. That's the reasons why we don't celebrate on Saturday, which we probably should. There you go. Whew. That's a lot to talk about. All right. I think I've made your head spin right about this point. If I haven't, well, I'm terribly surprised. Anyway, if you guys want to discuss this or if you want me to follow up on this, I'd be happy to do so. If you want me to break some of this information down, I'd be happy to do so. Just leave some comments down below and I'll tell you more in a future video because I'm losing my voice now, so I want you to stay tuned.